Okay, I'm here with my favorite hormone optimization expert, Dr. Mark Gordon. People are always excited when you're on because you always deliver incredible information that's highly usable and you have such a great track record of doing so much research that is highly effective. And today we're going to talk about pregnenolone because you know when, when people think of hormones, they always think of testosterone or estrogen and sometimes growth hormone. But there's so many other hormones that are super important. And I think pregnenolone gets left out on that. I think a lot of times people look at pregnenolone as important for what it can convert into, but pregnenolone, just as DHEA, they're both important in and of themselves. So let's get into the benefits of pregnenolone, why people should make that paramount to optimize. Well, thanks, Mike, for having me on the show again. It's always a pleasure to be able to share with you and your viewers um, the information that has been at the foundation of what I've been doing for the past 30 years now. I can't believe it's been 30 years. Yeah, long time. I've been practiced for 43 years. So um, the importance of pregnenolone is not only in isolation as pregnenolone, but the fact that where pregnenolone comes from, and it comes from cholesterol, and cholesterol converts to the first hormone in what we call the steroidogenesis, which is all the steroid hormones of our body, more than 35 hormones. And it's the conversion of cholesterol to pregnenolone, as well as the conversion of pregnenolone to progesterone and something called pregnenodiol, and then the progesterone conversion to allopregnanolone. Now, those are in a cascade from one to another to another that are extremely important as a group. So I can, you know, when I talk about one, there's a lot of benefits of the entire group. As an overall uh, overview of these pregnenolone, allopregnenolone, pregnenodiol, and progesterone is the fact that they regulate a whole bunch of brain chemistry that helps to benefit us. Uh, we know that as a group, what they do is they diminish inflammation in the brain because they're free radical scavengers, as well as they turn on circuits, which lower the inflammation in the brain. We know that they all turn on uh, the production of uh, GABA, GABA amino butyric acid, which is extremely important for our ability to go into deep sleep, REM sleep, deep sleep. And if you don't have adequate amount of pregnenolone and or progesterone, what you see is insomnia, panic attack, uh, irritability, uh, depression, anxiety. And in fact, uh, one of the byproducts of pregnenolone to progesterone to allopregnanolone has been made into a pharmaceutical medication that they call brexanolone. It's really allopregnanolone, but they call it brexanolone, which is their chemical name for it. They have a proprietary name, Zuroso, uh, something of that sort, but it's about $34,000 a year. Huh. And it, yeah, just for the medication, that doesn't include the delivery to your body. You have to go into a hospital for 30 days, uh, excuse me, for 30 hours to get a slow IV infusion, 30 hours every month to get the infusion. And it came out initially, seven years ago, for postpartum depression, but it also works for depression, anxiety, and um, also for improvement of sleep, which they haven't gone after, I don't believe, um, the FDA approval to state it does that. We know it does that because the pharmaceutical drug is equivalent to our um, biological product called allopregnanolone, which is developed by taking oral pregnenolone which gets converted to progesterone, which gets converted to allopregnanolone. How do we know that? Well, reading the literature as I do, there are studies showing how well pregnenolone taken oral is converted into allopregnanolone in the brain, as well as we do something called blood testing. And that <laughs> blood testing shows us that the pregnenolone gets absorbed and that it gets converted into uh, pregnenolone. Unfortunately, uh, there's a sparsity of laboratories none really, <laughs> that cl clinical labs out there for me to use that do the allopregnanolone test. So we don't have that. 
So what we do is we look at the level of pregnenolone and progesterone. If they're low, we know there's no substrate. There's no precursor to be converted into the allopregnenolone. So going back to the group, the group is associated with um, neuroregeneration. So if you have lost nerves, it helps nerves regenerate. Uh, neuronic neuro repair, so it helps with repair. And it's not directly because it turns on other systems, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It drops inflammation to help improve the environment. In the past, I've talked about the neuropermissive environment, which is a, an environment where the nerves and all the supportive um, cells called glial cells can function optimally in a very, um, um, a very uh, fostering environment. It's like growing plants in a cesspool. They're not going to grow. Right. But having the right balance of nutrients and you know, the sulfur, the nitrate, and the potassium in the soil, it'll grow well. Well, our brain is something like that. You need to have a great amount of balance in the chemistry in the brain. So the pregnenolone to progesterone to allopregnanolone. Allopregnanolone, obviously, because it was made into a pharmaceutical drug, is the one that is the key element for helping the brain with optimized functioning. So by helping with the balance intracellularly of the nutrients, the balance between the different excitatory and suppressive or uh, depressing um, uh, neurotransmitters that are in the brain, the NMDA, the, um, the other one is the GABA receptors. Uh, NMDA is the stimulatory ones, the GABA, the relaxing ones. That's why people take GABA and 5-hydroxytryptophan in order to get into a relaxation mode. Melatonin helps. Growth hormone helps because growth hormone increases melatonin. Growth hormone drops inflammation. So now that we have a little bit of an overview, the key issue is at the beginning. And what is at the beginning is cholesterol. Cholesterol is the main substrate, meaning the first chemical that we need to be converted to pregnenolone. And if you don't have adequate amount of cholesterol, what happens is you can't make pregnenolone. And therefore you can't make 35 plus hormones that are part of this cascade of all our hormones. So you have cholesterol and downstream, you've got testosterone, DHT, you've got estrone, estradiol, estriol, you've got cortisol. You've got, you know, 11-hydroxycortisone. You've got progesterone, pregnenolone, allopregnenolone, all these steroidogenic hormones, inclusive of vitamin D, which is from cholesterol. So if you do anything to disrupt your cholesterol production, you lose all those hormones. And in the study I was just re-reviewing, it actually showed that people who maintain cholesterol levels at 200 or less had a four to five time increased risk of developing de dementia of whatever variety you want to state it. And the people with higher levels of cholesterol did not. And why is that? Because you kept on supplying the primary substrate to the brain to make it into the hormones that regulate the brain, which takes us back to the early 1980s with a Dr. Uh, Bailou from Paris, France, who was the man, the doctor, who identified that in our brain, the cells in our brain have all the enzymes necessary to convert cholesterol to pregnenolone, to DHEA, to testosterone, to, to estradiol, to androstenedione, to estrone, to cortisol. It's all in our neuron, in our cells in the brain, the glial cells, the astrocytes, the oligodendrocytes, the um, neurons also can convert uh, cholesterol into some of these uh, hormones. In fact, uh, my mother died with what's called statin dementia, where she was put on an extremely high level of uh, statins for about five years when the real problem with her elevation cholesterol was from low thyroid. Also, low testosterone causes elevation in cholesterol. So when you're looking at cholesterol, it's not just 
Oh, cholesterol is elevated. Give a pill to take care of it. You got to look for causation, which, as you know, every doctor does, right? <laughs> That's a ding. <laughs> Time out. On my end, let me make sure I shut these off because my phone is connected to this. Okay. So, anyway, going. so cholesterol is extremely important to generate pregnenolone. And pregnenolone has another name. It's called the mother of all hormones because from pregnenolone, it can either go down one pathway or a secondary pathway. If it goes down one pathway, it's pregnenolone, progesterone, allopregnenolone, and to, uh, to allopregnanolone. On the other pathway, it goes to DHEA, DHEAS, it goes to androstenedione, estrone, it goes to testosterone, DHT, estradiol, estradiol goes to estrone, estrone to estriol. So that entire pathway, and then there are hormones in between that we totally ignore, but we are finding they have incredible benefits in the entire neurological system. Now, all those hormones that are produced in the brain have picked up a new name called neurosteroids. And the ones that are produced below the neck in the, you know, the testicles, the ovaries, the thacal cells of the ovaries, the Leydig cells of the testicles, the adrenal glands for DHEA and the thy thyroid for thyroid hormones and so forth are called neuroactive steroids. And therefore, you know, the ones below the neck, some of them can get into the brain and add to benefits to brain function. But the real issue is the ones that are produced in the brain have a real time effect. What does that mean? Real time means if they're produced now, the benefits are now. The ones that come from below the neck, the, not, the uh, neuroactive steroids, have a different pathway that they use uh, in the nerve receptor. So it becomes a genetic trigger. So it can take hours to days before you get the benefit. One called inotropic, which is the ones in the brain, and then the metabotropic are the ones that are genetically more a genetic manipulation. So the pregnenolone is extremely important. So if you mess up with cholesterol, you cannot generate the pregnenolone. And a point which I've been pushing, pushing, I know you've heard me do the push it along a lot, is that the question is what is the hormone? that regulates the conversion of cholesterol to the mother of all hormones, pregnenolone. And that's called luteinizing hormone. Right. So luteinizing hormone is the rate limiting hormone to allow cholesterol to be converted to all the hormones. Testosterone is what we usually talk about. So the question is, how do we shut off luteinizing hormone so that in a healthy 20-year-old, 18-year-old, 25-year-old, 40, 50-year-old, they're stopped making testosterone because something has happened to luteinizing hormone as the focal. There are other things, but we'll focus on that for now. And the luteinizing hormone can be downregulated, shut off by taking things like testosterone, by taking things like estradiol, by taking certain vaxes recently, right. by having brain inflammation, by being hit on the head, mm -hmm. by being exposed to radiation, by toxins in the air, by endocrine disrupting hormones like glyphosates, they will interrupt the brain's ability to receive the luteinizing hormone trigger to start the cascade of conversion of cholesterol to pregnenolone, down to, to testosterone, estradiol, pregnenolone, progesterone, and so forth. So how is that happening? Well, in 2013, a group of articles started coming out where they showed that the area of the brain called the hypothalamus is responsible for producing the chemical trigger to tell the pituitary to make FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone that deals in men with sperm production and women, ovra, ova, and luteinizing hormone, which causes testosterone and estrogen to be made in the thacal cells of women and testosterone and estrogen from the latex cells of men. 
Well, what they found is inflammation shuts off the ability of the hypothalamus to generate that signal. So you end up having loss of testosterone, estrogen, and all your hormone production because you lose luteinizing hormone. Other things that will influence that, as I said, is are certain, of, well, all vaccines cause inflammation in the brain because they cause inflammation as part of the immune stimulating function of every vaccine. So yeah. I won't pick on any one particular, though the most recent one is the one that's creating the greatest amount of havoc with thousands of articles coming out in the past two years showing that it denigrates the ability of the brain to produce follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So if you don't produce testosterone and you're 20 years of age, what do you think person's gonna develop? Yeah, serious depression. <laughs> Physical and mental symptoms, depression being number one. Uh, cognition, because when right. we look at when we look at the literature as a bulk on testosterone benefits, you see that to free testosterone, not total testosterone, total testosterone is junk. Free testosterone is responsible for sense of well-being, a plum, assertiveness, competitiveness, memory, recall, the ability to learn new things, uh, anti-depression, great sex, uh, creativity, music, visual, uh, writing abilities. And how do we know? We've had people with, uh, you know, from major um, music groups, writers, Academy Award winning writers, painters, artists who have lost it, their edge. And when we looked at their history, they had either a head trauma, car accident, slip and fall or something, and or were on medication that um, interrupted the ability to make hormones uh, for the brain to make the neurosteroids. So the importance of cholesterol to pregnenolone, then pregnenolone to progesterone. Progesterone is interesting. Too high of a progesterone can alter your body's ability to make DHT, dihydrotestosterone, right. because it blocks the enzyme that converts the, um, pro, uh, the testosterone to the DHT. That's 5-alpha reductase 1 hormone. Yeah, sometimes or, testosterone creams are combined with progesterone for that purpose. Yeah. Like some of that conversion of testosterone right. to DHT. Right. Um, about uh, in the early 2000s, there was a, a beautiful study done just on that topic where they put topical testosterone on the skin and they monitored free, total, and DHT. They found that about 70% of the uh, testosterone converted to DHT. Right. And then... They went and, and they were using radioactive isotope for monitoring it. Then they put progesterone onto the skin first and then put on top of it testosterone. And you saw the majority of it maintained as free testosterone. It was right. a beautiful, beautiful study, which told us that the hair follicles yeah. produce 5-alpha reductase. And the problem with DHT is DHT in the liver increases sex hormone binding globulin. DHT causes thinning of the hair, hair loss, acne, oily skin, enlargement of the prostate, shrinkage of the testicles. It's, a, in fact, according to uh, one or two articles, that DHT is four times stronger at shrinking testicles than uh, testosterone is. And wow. it makes sense. Testosterone is the precursor. DHT is the activated form. Right. Interesting issue is that DHT and the reason why we monitor DHT so closely in our military that we take care of with traumatic brain injury and neuropsychiatric problems is because DHT can't get into the brain. That's why, you know, people who develop, um, what is it called, uh, from uh, nandrolone deconate, uh, all the DHT decadic. Yeah, <laughs> I, I wanted you to say it before me, so I, it's clear <laughs> for me to say it. <laughs> well, it's because when you use things like, uh, what is it called, uh, Tribulon and uh, the one with an M and the uh, Nangelone decoinate, that right. it shuts down your production of uh, luteinizing. So you don't make testosterone. So in your body, if you don't add testosterone to it, in your body, you've got this 
DHT congener, which is a chemical that looks like DHT, functions like DHT, but isn't, and it can't get into the brain. Well, it turns out that our brain needs DHT to function. So the free testosterone that gets made in the brain is converted to DHT. The free testosterone that's made below the neck or injected into your body is brought into the brain for the benefits. So you want to make sure you're not actively converting or rapidly converting um, testosterone, free testosterone to DHT. And a mineral deficiency called selenium can yeah. foster increased conversion of uh, DH, uh, testosterone to DHT. So going back to the pro, uh, progesterone issue, progesterone also, if it's too high, can cause insulin um, insensitivity. So your blood sugar can go up. So it can give you a false appearance of uh, being diabetic. So in our treating our patients with pregnenolone, some people convert it beautifully to progesterone, others not so well. Um, and we monitor their blood sugar and we see insulin and blood sugar, we see alterations where they're insulin resistant and progesterone can cause that. And then it makes sense when you think of women who are pregnant and they develop you know, a white classification, W-H-I-T-E, which is uh, the classification, white classification one, two, three, four, which is the degree of uh, uh, perinatal diabetes they develop. Well, look at the progesterone level. It's sky high during pregnancy, you know? So that it all makes sense. It's all, when you start putting the pieces of the puzzle together, you get this beautiful picture with flows that, you know, shows you the, shows you the relationship. So progesterone is uh, important for us because of what it then becomes. It then becomes allopregnanolone. And it's allopregnanolone that the literature is talking about in an, its relevant relevancy to injectable or testosterone. And what that relevancy is, is that if you're using testosterone for a long period of time, testosterone wants to be, if you're using excessive amount, the body has built in a protective system. It says, huh, testosterone level's too high. Let's convert it to two other things. What are the two other things it converts it to? Estradiol and DHT. And over time, what happens is that 5-alpha reductase enzyme gets drained from the system. You can't keep up with it. So you lose 5-alpha reductase. Well, it turns out that 5-alpha reductase is also important for a second conversion in the body, in the brain. And that's the conversion of progesterone to allopregnanolone. So if you're not converting progesterone to allopregnanolone because you don't have the enzyme because you've been on too much testosterone, what are the symptoms? Anxiety, depression, edginess, irritability, emotional volatility. Huh, let's think of people that we've seen in our history, yeah. you know, from boxers, from uh, MMA guys who take uh, chairs and hit themselves or they kill their son and their wife. Yeah. 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 The wrestlers who did that. Yeah. yeah people, and, it's, right? and it's not the fact that they're on high dose of testosterone. It's the fact that what that did to their system to allow for that change in personality. So we're experiencing it right now in something called the post finasteride syndrome. Right. The post finasteride syndrome is a, a drug, finasteride, durasteride and finasteride, which block the 5-alpha reductase enzyme. And there's a, a post-finasteride syndrome foundation, which I participate with. And what they have clearly shown is that um, the finasteride in blocking the uh, presence, uh, the ability to convert progesterone to allopregnanolone, they develop all these psychological problems. And because of the lack of DHT, they get emotional problems and physical problems to boot. So difficulty in the gym, difficulty doing physical activity because you don't have DHT. Why is DHT important? Because the muscles need DHT in order to feed them. DHT and DHEA, di, uh, dihydroepiandosterone, which is from pregnenolone to DHEA, 
DHEA and DHT from testosterone help to bring glyc uh, glucose into the myocells, myocytes, to generate glycogen, which is the fuel to run muscles. So if you're using things that block the DHT or you have a very low level of DHEA, you're not going to be able to recover or to maintain musculature. So you can have additional problems with weakness or just lack of muscle strength. So the uh, post finasteride syndrome is due to the fact that it blocks the conversion of progesterone to allopregnanolone. So that's due uh, also the same mechanism as chronic dosing of uh, testosterone. That's why it's important to um, to monitor your DHT level when you're on testosterone to make sure it doesn't drop, not to use anything caustic to block the DHT like finasteride and durasteride. Um, there are natural things like EGCG that can help, quercetin can help, uh, sulfamethyl, pygium africanum, and um, um, pumpkin seed. These, right. There's a whole bunch of natural things that'll help. Zinc is very important too, for slowing down the conversion of free testosterone to um, estradiol. Okay, so there's a lot of benefits there. The things such as sal palmetto, that's not gonna lower the conversion too much. It's not gonna drive down DHT too much the way finasteride would. Uh, correct, you know, the, the medications are very, very uh, focal on what they do. Uh, sal palmetto um, being in a gelatinous cap, most of them are oils in a cap, Right. So they get well better absorbed after meal. So if you take them after meal, they get absorbed better. Um, using a multitude of, uh, there's one product I use uh, from Pure Encapsulations that has all three of the sopamento, the Pygium Africanum, and this pumpkin seed, yeah. which are all great. And if you, you know, you eat uh, lots of seeds, seeds are very good for the minerals they contain, uh, the zinc, the selenium, the copper, cobalt, I mean, copper and chromium and so forth. Right. Um, these are all very good for the micronutrients and for as cofactors to a number of uh, biological systems in our body. Just zinc's involved in over 300 processes yeah. in our body. Yeah. So not to downregulate. And I think there are a lot more people are mineral deficient than they know. Oh, yeah. Because, yeah, you're drinking, you know, straight up bottled water without any scotch in it. A scotch has some kind of mineral in it, you know. <laughs> so that's my excuse, you know, <laughs> once a week. <laughs> but um, oh, just uh, real, going back to luteinizing hormones, something such as Clomid, which you give to a lot of people to increase their testosterone, it works very well. I've used your protocol before. Would that also, because it increases luteinizing hormone, could you use Clomid to ramp up your own production of pregnenolone and DHEA as well? Yeah. Um, you know, some years back, I think it was maybe 2014, when we started the uh, Veterans Three-Year Project, which was 2014, 15, 16, which looked at the use of Clomid. And I was just talking with the company that, pharmaceutical company that lost e-Clomid because the FDA failed to approve it, you know, right. so it went into the um, the compounding pharmacies. Yeah. But um, I was I was and am using lots of clomiphene citrate, and the reason being is it's not luteinizing hormone, it's not testosterone. What it does is it fakes your hypothalamus to think you're deficient in estradiol, and therefore it responds by producing gonadotropic releasing hormone, which is the hormone that's blocked by inflammation, COVID, okay, by infection. Mm -hmm. And you, it goes, the gonadotropic releasing hormone goes to the pituitary and turns on both follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. That's why clomid is used as a fertility drug in females. And I've used it as a fertility drug in males who burnt out their system from using testosterone alone. Yeah. And one of the one of the things you know I use uh, use the um, e uh, excuse me the clomiphene. We're using a little bit of e clomid. We're using clomiphene to stimulate testosterone production and to restart people's testosterone production when they come into us 
after right. they tried to burn out their system. Yeah. And uh, we have a program which is called the hybrid program where we pe put people on Clomid and testosterone concurrently, as you know. And I had one guy say to me, Doc, you know, all the doctors out there give Clomid as a recovery after right. you've been on testosterone for maybe 12, 16 weeks. I said, yes, I know that, but think of it in these terms. You get into your brand new Porsche, 911 Turbo Carrera, and you drive 60 miles an hour into a wall, <laughs> and then you put your seatbelt on. <laughs> right. The Clomid is the seatbelt when you get into that car, and the car representing the testosterone you put yourself on. So what happens is, and I've got a number of, uh, of our vets who were on testosterone, 200 milligrams every Sunday for five years. Yeah. Burnt out his system. We tried for six months trying to restart it. He's stuck at 43 years of age for the rest of his life, may it be long, uh, taking shots of testosterone. Right. Okay. And it just totally freaks me out when we've got 20 year olds, 23 year olds, 25 year olds, 30, 40 year olds coming into the practice and they're on high doses of testosterone and no clomid or nothing to protect them, e clomid, whatever, yeah. to protect them. And I don't find beta HCG works that well. You know, I think it's, it didn't work well for the diet program. It was stupid anyway. Uh, you know, if you eat 500 calories a day, you're going to lose weight. Right. Oh, beta HCG makes it easier for you to only eat 500 calories. How would you know if you didn't try the person out just eating 500? You know, <laughs> the logic is just pretzel logic. So, yeah, it's just crazy. So, so we're, we're talking about clomid. You brought yeah. up clomiphene a couple of times. And so for people that are not familiar, there's two isomers with clomid. There's clomiphene and there's zooclomiphene. And I believe a 50 milligram tablet of Clomid is about 38 milligrams of inclomiphene and about 12 milligrams of zooclomiphene, if I'm using the right analysis. Yeah, six to, yeah, six to 12. I'm curious that because people that, inclomiphene now is being marketed heavily. There's a lot of these online places where you can get a prescription in minutes and get on an inclomiphene protocol. Yeah. And they're often, they often promulgate the negatives of zooclomiphene. I'm wondering how you feel about if there are any negatives of zooclomiphene. And also it's it's 12 milligrams to 38 milligrams. So you're getting a hefty dose of inclomiphene because clomid is significantly cheaper too, and it's way more accessible. And honestly, just throwing in my personal experience, I've used inclomiphene before and I've used clomid. Honestly, I got better results with regular clomid. I didn't feel the same benefits. Now it's possible that the source I had wasn't legit, I don't know. But I've always found that Clomid at the dosing protocol you recommend, 50 milligrams every other day or every third day, works extremely well. Yep. And the negatives of zooclomiphene, I've never really felt those personally, supposedly that people get moody and you get depressed. It, are there, so are there negative, are, are there actual negatives of zooclomiphene? And also are there actual positives? Is it actually a beneficial thing to have? Yeah. Um the reason why I've stayed with Clomid is because the benefits across the board have outweighed any of the negatives that I really don't see. In fact, I'm in the 11th or 12th page of a paper uh, for general consumption, which I'll eventually post on my website, which is the story of Clomid in terms of how we've used it, uh, the scientific literature talking about side effects and what have you, and there, there has been since 2007 an incredible amount of three-year studies, two-year studies showing no side effects. Right. So why is it that you hear, and I did at one point hear, from patients saying, oh, I took one Clomid yesterday and today I've got floaters in my eyes. <laughs> I took one tablet of Clomid yesterday and I feel more girly, okay? <laughs> or my emotions are up or whatever. And, you know... <laughs> did have those side effects. Could they happen that fast? I mean, you know. Well, that's the point. <laughs> that they uh, had some where they're making those symptoms occur. <laughs> well, here, here's what I tell people now, or I started telling them way back when. I said, please do not go to the internet and look up side effects right, of right. citrate. It'll drive and you. Yeah. 
And the reason being is that they have one case of floaters or, you know, punched out one, whatever. And moodiness and insomnia, just a whole bunch of stuff. And I know that we're all unique. And I don't say that it's a psychiatric thing, but I tell people not to read it. And the reason why is a lot of the symptoms are based on what? Are based on daily use, high dose use in right. women. Right, right. Women use 50 to 200 milligrams a day for maybe five, seven days on a cycle that might be two or three times. We use 50 milligrams, as you said, every 72 hours, 48 hours, or 20 uh, or 48 hours. Every other day or every third day. We have a guy this morning who's on every fourth day. I've got a, about 12 guys who are taking one tablet a week, and they're getting and. Why one tablet? Based upon their blood test, it showed that they had this incredible sensitivity. Remind me, and we'll circle around to desensitizing Clomid or how it fails. Um, so things like floaters, we don't see, okay? And I've got over 800 people on Clomid, okay? So I've got an incredible population of people, and we monitor them once a month for one year, sometimes for two years. Sometimes they come back and do a quarterly report two years down the road. So we get 25 points of acquisition of information and they don't state about floaters or girliness or this, that, and the other. So looking at the positive, one of the things that occurred was um, one of our veterans who was a cop had his schedule changed. So he had to change the time he was taking his Clomid from every morning. When I started 2014, the bulk of my Clomid use, take it in the morning. And they took it in the morning and uh, did very well. This guy moves it to the nighttime when he gets home and takes it. And we have our blood work done. You know, we have our blood work done initially, then three months, then six months and then six months, uh, 12 months, and then once a year thereafter. So we do annual labs. So he's sitting with me with the annuals. Four or five months earlier, he had moved to his every nighttime, and we're chit-chatting about his lab results, looking really good, great testosterone levels, low DHT, great DHEA. And I said, so anything you need to report? He says, well, yeah, the strange thing happened. When I started taking the Clomid at night, I was waking up in the middle of the night with wood, yeah. Action for those people who don't know. Waking yeah. up with wood or people, you know, and it was incredible. Yeah. And it caused me to go back to my tracks of education and Dr. Abraham Morgenthaler, who right. you might hear, yeah. Abe wrote the book, Testosterone for Life. Right. And great advocate of using testosterone, doesn't believe in the mythology of testosterone causing prostate cancer, like a lot of us well-educated people are believing. And in one of the lectures he gave us was why not to chase estradiol, the benefits of estradiol in a male's body. And the reason why I've never chased it. If estradiol goes up too, too high, what is it telling you? It's telling you that the body is converting the excess testosterone that they're on to either estradiol and or DHT, mostly both. So it turns out that, as I said, in the hypothalamus, clomiphene citrate, clomid, whatever variety, blocks the receptors called estradiol receptors in the brain. And so what happens is there's estradiol floating around and now it doesn't have a place to sit on, a receptor. So it means that the quantity of free floating estradiol goes up. It's got to go to some other place like the libido center right. in the limbic system, the libido center. Okay. So it cross talks to this other area and that's how you get improvement in your libido. And we know this, there's a peptide called PT-141. Yeah. PT-141, got a number of patients on it. They love it. It works in that area of the brain. It's a, uh, uh, it's a melanocotropin. It's a melanocotropin, and it, which means it's like melanin. It's like pigment. So it's a, the Russians. You know, the Russians developed a lot of stuff. Um, 
and it uh, stimulates for up to three days yeah. your right. reaction yeah. your reaction so guys they see something smell something taste something it if it has a sexual component to it an erection develops and it works centrally as opposed to things like Viagra, Levitra, and Cialis that work peripherally. Right. They work on the blood flow. But the command, the, the, the libido center in the limbic, the, that's the area. And it's because of this elevation in, in, estri, in estradiol. So what I did was after he told me that, I said, let's test this out. For six months, I put half my guys on clomiphene citrate in the morning, half the guys at night. The guys at night, all of them had wood. So what did Gordon do? Gordon started taking <laughs> me, started taking the Clomid at night. And sure enough, a couple of days of taking the Clomid, it's unbelievable. You yeah. know, it, it works. So anyway, the benefits and the detriments of uh, the use of Clomiphene citrate. Um, the sensation of emotionality, uh, you know, that's a stretch for me, but with the analogy I just gave you about libido, yeah, there could be people out there that are sensitive through whatever pathway I haven't been able to clearly see, you know, in, in OBGYN literature on uh, female uh, neuroendocrinology. Um, I haven't looked really, really deep, but I really haven't found anything that says, oh, yeah, estradiol causes emotions through this pathway. But it, there is a pathway. We just, I just haven't found it. I know there has to be. Otherwise, why would it happen? Person just wants to be uh, hyper emotional? No, I don't think so. Uh, in terms of the floaters, I haven't been able to find anything that categorically def tells me that how clomiphene causes floaters in the eye. Because floaters in the eye are protein that proteins that are deposited in the vitreous humor in the fluid of the uh, inner eye or in the uh, outer eye. And, um, you know, so for a while there, I was having people go to ophthalmologists to see it, and the ophthalmologist didn't find anything. Yeah. But the people are saying there, so I'm saying, is it psychological because they read yeah. all the side effects? You know, is it, it's called conversion hysteria. OK, so conversion hysteria. And it seemed to happen in most of the guys I was seeing who really didn't want to be put on to clomid. They wanted to be put on to injectable testosterone. I got it. I got it. Why come to a doc who does, the, you know, endocrinology or does HRT, TRT, neuroendocrinology to just be put onto a tablet that... <laughs> in their convenience, can take it every other or every third night and get incredible levels of testosterone. I mean, these 12, 12 guys that are only on one a week, they get thousands in their testosterone. And I had one guy who had 37 of free testosterone where the normal range is uh, from three, which is obviously too low, three to 27. Right. Okay, and 15 is where we want it to be. Three and 27 divided by two is 15 in the middle. That's beautiful level. Everybody, when they get to 15, are feeling great. You don't need to be up in 20, 25, right. except, except in the group of patients with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia, multiple sclerosis, and my daughter has one case of uh, ALS. Mm -hmm. That according to his doctor, not me, not her, According to the patient's personal doctor, neurologist said he's getting better. His, you know, an ALS, an early symptom is um, uh, difficulty swallowing. That disappeared. So fantastic. It, was, it, it worked very well. So um, circling back to uh, the luteinizing hormone, because in 2018. Just, just, real, just real quick, just to summarize. So the zuclomiphene, you don't feel that's an issue at all based on everything you've said. It's No. It's, is there some positive to it, though? That's what I'm curious about. I go because it seems that now they're trying to the current narrative is that all the benefits of Clomid are in, in clomiphene. So why don't we just isolate that and then get rid of zooclomiphene, which may have some possible negatives. It doesn't sound like there's any negatives based on no. client population, not a, no real negatives based on my personal results either. But I'm just curious if that narrative makes sense in any way is that if inclement has all the benefits and let's just cut out what is unessential right well the push for 
E. Coleman was always, and I've got the papers from the ma original manufacturer who wasn't able to bring it to market, right. uh, was that it was supposed to drop any of the side effects associated with clomiphene citrate. Right. And I had, I don't see them. I mean, right. they're well, a rare occurrence. To begin with. You know? <laughs> yeah, they're a rare occurrence. So to be perfectly honest, you know, between, I think I have maybe two people that are on E. Coleman. Right. And 800 plus that are on uh, clomiphene citrate. I just restarted a guy today who uh, special ops, he's a physician assistant now because he was able to regain his mental after the military, his capacity, TBI and all that stuff. And uh, he was off of his clomiphene citrate for uh, June of last year until this morning. And he said he recognized the big difference being on and off. We didn't put him on injectable testosterone, just yeah. clone. He's 40, uh, it, early 40s, okay? So and he's doing, he says when he's on it, he's got energy, he's exercising, he's losing weight, you know, all the benefits. It's, you know, it's not Clomid. It's what Clomid does to yeah, increase your testosterone. So yeah. you've got, you know, you've got six things in front of you that all raise the testosterone level. So what are we going to look for? We're going to look for the one that is, least government regulated. We're going to look for the one that doesn't need a needle. We're going to look for the one that is closest to being pure. We're going to look for one that is easy to take and one that's cost effective. And the one that fits that for us has been the uh, clomiphene citrate. Eclomid, we're getting it compounded by one, two labs, and it's reasonable. You know, it's like 100 Thirty-six dollars, I think I was told. I just found out the price uh, last week. One hundred thirty-six dollars for sixty pills, and sixty pills last sixty uh, six months on our protocol. Uh, what is that? Twenty milligrams? Or if, how many? Uh, oh no, six point two five. On oh, six point two five. Yeah, six point two five. Which I thought was a little bit low, but he's taking it every day now. Right, uh, right, so, right. So it adds see, up. Yeah. So what you want to do really is you want to pulse the system. You want to pulse it because if you look at this is another area that I don't always see agreement in the community of uh, neuroendocrinology, endocrinology, pharmacology, is that clomiphene has a 14-day half-life. So seven times 14 is what? 98 uh, days. So it lasts in the body for 98 days. Wonderful. So it's in and out of the body in 98 days. The question really is, how long does the effects of Clomid last in the cells? And it's it's Clomid in the hypothalamus, LH in the pituitary, and then Leydig cells production of testosterone. So uh, Clomid works in the hypothalamus. How long does it last there? 31 days. 31 days. And then the question is, how long for the pituitary and luteinizing hormone production? How long does that last? I don't know because I haven't found it. And then the question is, how long does uh, a pulse stimulation of the Leydig cells in the testicles lead to prolonged production of um, testosterone? Okay. There's uh, some articles. I just haven't had a chance to read them again. But you need to look at those pathways. It's like growth hormone. People take growth hormone and then they stop and they immediately think they're feeling worse. Well, the actual intracellular benefits of growth hormone, IGF-1, is eight to 12 weeks. So the reason why way back when I was using you know, lots of growth hormone, I would take a hiatus for three months or eight to 10, 12 weeks, and then restart. Because the effects of the uh, growth hormone on my genetics, and that's how all hormones work, is they turn on gene expression. And those genes lead to muscle, lead to anti-inflammation, lead to this, this, and the other stuff. So that's what I was looking at, is the functional, intracellular functionality of hormones. How long does it last? That is the key. So pulsing the product gives your body ability to pulse it. And then the 
peak effects of the clomid drop a little, and then you pulse it again. And we found the uh, in the majority of people, 72 hours between pulses yeah. seems to be the most ideal. But the guy today, his is 84 hours. And then we've got 12 guys that it might be, you know, seven times 24, 140 plus, uh, was that 28, 158 hours or 168 hours where they're doing, you know, really well and they just need one tablet. Right. You know, and what blew me away about that in those 12 guys, what age group do you think those 12 guys represented? What would you assume to get that kind of sensitivity from Clomid? I mean, you would assume that they're much younger. Yeah. But that's I wouldn't right. be, but, but Clomid is so effective, I think I wouldn't be surprised if they're in their 40s and 50s, honestly. Well, that's the point. We had guys between 20 and 50 who were having levels that were just phenomenal, which reset my mind's thought that instead of trying to predict who will, just monitor it yeah. to see it. And that's how we found 12 guys. Yeah. And because they didn't have side effects. Right, because sometimes the, the common narrative is, oh, if you're over this age, why don't you, do, you, you should probably just right. get on TRT. Clomid, right. natural production methods are probably not going to work. But it's, it's, it's somewhat irrelevant, because even with my testosterone booster, for example, I have guys in their 60s that have great levels. They went from 400 to 650 or higher sometimes. And sometimes there's young guys that are non-responders. You know, so it's yeah. not as simple as, oh, if you're young, it'll be very effective. If you're much older, then it probably won't be that effective. You really don't know until you try. You could, you could, And then it's so much more convenient than taking shots, either going to a clinic once a week to get a big needle in your ass or doing even microducing. You got to you got to have the needles around all the time. What if you're traveling? What if you're going somewhere for two weeks? You're just going to pre dose a bunch of needles. I guess you could do that. But it's, an, it's inconvenient when you yeah. can just. The pill. I think the mistake people make with Clomid is they think, okay, I'm getting great results with this every 72 hours. Let me take it every day. I'll get even better results. And then it starts becoming a negative feedback loop. I think right. that's key right there too, is that even, even if you tell people, okay, we do every other day or we do every third day, what are most people going to hear from that? Oh, I'll start with every other day just because you know, I want to yeah. ramp it up more. When they may get better results with every third day, and in fact, they may get better results with, with once every four or five days, as you just well, mentioned. And so, the way we determine that is we'll have them on three months of the Clomid, and then the following, uh, they'll take it at night, that following morning, we do a blood test that's called the peak. Right, right. And we see how high their body responds to its production. And what we do first, we don't do peak first, we do trough first, which means that if a person was scheduled to take their pill that night, that morning, they go get their blood drawn. That'll be the lowest effect of the Clomid. And right. we're looking to see uh, the height of their testosterone the furthest distance from their clomid and we have people who are still doing great levels for us that trough between 10 and 15 is the key and then yeah. of course we, do you have any symptoms of you know do you feel a drop off some people say yes some people say no and if their circuitry and that's another benefit of the clomid if clomid is to work you have to have the hypothalamus working the pituitary needs to work and the little guys down below need to work. Okay. Right. If you've right. been using testosterone a long time, the little guys, but yeah. yeah, I, you know, when I was uh, working in the adult industry, not me personally, but working <laughs> for the people, <laughs> <in> the, <laughs> you know, I used yeah. to take care of a lot of people from the adult industry, the gals and the guys. Yeah. And they asked me, is there anything we can do to increase testicular size and so forth and so on? So, we use Clomid. Really? Uh, yeah, because in a uh, higher dose, it can actually force growth of the latex cells of the testicular function. You know, so <laughs> well, what would be a higher dose for that purpose? Uh, every day. Oh, okay. Okay, so 50 milligrams every yeah. day? Okay. 50 every day. I do have people who take 25 milligrams every third day. Okay. Get phenomenal levels, 25 milligrams every other day. I do have maybe handful of guys that are taking 25 every day instead mm -hmm. of 50 50 was too much 25 was better yeah. but i like pulsing it because it gives yeah. a rest and it doesn't 
mess up the receptors as badly. Now, talking about receptors, in 2018, a brilliant article came out of Denmark, of all places. And what they looked at was uh, a pattern of hormones where luteinizing hormone was high and testosterone production was low. Well, if luteinizing hormone is high, you should have high level of testosterone, except if the ability of the cells of the testicles called the Leydig cells were not able to generate testosterone. So that classically in medicine, in endocrinology, in internal medicine, family practice, all the docs who take care of basic TRT, HRT, is called compensatory hypogonadism, meaning that the testicles are unable to make testosterone, so the brain tries to fix it by increasing the level of luteinizing hormone, okay, to try and force it, you know, a lot of power behind the right. signal. Well, I'm going to beat the shit out of your testicles to make <laughs> testosterone is basically yeah. what it's saying. Well, yeah. this article in 2018, what it showed is one of the most common pain medications that we get without prescription and can also get with prescription changes the epigenetics of the testicles so you can't make the connection between luteinizing hormone receptor and the production of testosterone, and that is ibuprofen. Mm. So ibuprofen alters the ability of the luteinizing hormone to turn on Leydig cell production of testosterone, okay? So I was seeing a lot of vets over the, what, I've been working with them since uh, 2009, so I've seen a lot of, and then since Andrew Marr came on board with Adam Marr and so forth and all the military, I've been seeing tons of military, over 1,600 we've supported in our program with great responses. So in them, I kept on seeing the pattern of elevated luteinizing hormone and low testosterone, which is classical primary hypogonadism. The treatment for that is immediately put them onto testosterone which I was doing yeah. until I came across this article and in 2018 and totally changed everything I do. What's different is we put them on 50 milligrams of clomiphene citrate every day for 30 days and then to every other day for 30 days and then to every 72 hours. And what it does is it pushes through the block forces the body from such high levels of luteinizing hormone to turn the system back on. We've got nine, 10 guys now that we've turned the system back on. And we have a 56 year old who went through it. He's off Clomid. He's been off Clomid for, let's see, January, for March will be a year. He's still maintaining good levels, not excellent levels, good level for a 56 year old yeah. army, uh, army major out of Fort Hood, uh, keeping great levels. Okay. And we have people who are coming back with normalized levels. I've got a female that we put on to this protocol, Clomiphen, right? Who, uh, she's in the movie, uh, Julianne, uh, the Wait. gymnast. Okay. Julianne in the movie. And, um, she's off everything except uh, Brain Rescue 1 or 3. She loves the Brain Rescue because, oh, she was stalled at just getting her undergraduate degree in kinesiology, you know, muscle, skeleton, all that, taking people care of people with cerebral palsy, birth defects and whatever, and all those uh, birth defects that lead to physical dysfunction. She ended up getting her PhD last year. Wow. Now I have the ple pleasure of calling her doctor. Yeah. Uh, she was on her back for eight in the, in the movie. She talks about it. Yeah. She was on her back for 18 months on a multitude of drugs for migraines, for blah, 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 depression, anxiety. And, and the movie you're referring to is Quiet Explosions, which people can stream on Amazon. It's available. It's really good. Yeah, it it's good. And um, do you have a copy of it? I do. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a copy of it? I think I bought it when it was when it came out on Amazon. So I, yeah, I'm able to I, it. 
uh, not to be uh, commercial, but uh, I bought the rights to the movie for our thumb drives. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, so what I'll do is um, remind me, I'll get you uh, a code for your wa- listeners, your viewers, okay. so they can get the uh, the movie for um, half price. Okay, excellent. Okay, on thumb drive, okay? Okay. On thumb drive. Just remind me, I'll get that set up for you. Because it's uh, by seeing the cases that we've taken care of, there were 10 cases in the movie. It's not about me. It's not about me strutting my stuff. It's about the people explaining how they were and how they are now. Yeah. No, it's really well done. Yeah. And I had nothing to do with it. It's uh, Andrew Marr and uh, Jerry Shear, the producer director of it, who's brilliant. She won. Uh, two uh, Emmy Awards for other documentaries. This one was nominated for two Academies, I think it was in 2022, and continues to glean a lot of awards. And it's really become a calling card to let military football, you see some very popular football people, gymnasts, um, heart attack people. Uh, One guy who had a heart attack for 20 years, he was doing horrible and gets on our protocol. He's like a kid again. So... But anyway, so ibuprofen in any doctors out there or any individuals who have been on ibuprofen for a long time and then were found to have low level of testosterone, it's the ibuprofen. And been trying to put a timeline on how long it lasts. It it turns out that it can last forever unless you fix it. Wow. Yeah. And we've, you know, reversed a dozen, about a dozen people now. Uh, with um, this compensatory uh, hypogonadism or primary uh, hypogonadism um, where your body is making luteinizing hormone but not making uh, the testosterone. There's a block. It's an enzyme block. If you've been taking ibuprofen for a long time and you just stop, that's not enough in in many cases just to reboot your own luteinizing hormone and testosterone. Wow. Yeah, well, we have, uh, let's see, the longest was 2007, so that's uh, 15, 16, 17, 17 years ago, they stopped their ibuprofen, but they were, you know, in the military, they call it pain candy, they call it pain Skittles. Right, right. You know, they have all these names for it. It's because you can get it at any CVS or Walgreens. Right. They go they up were- 800 milligrams two times a day wow. for blocks of three weeks, uh, two weeks the lowest, uh, excuse me, one week the lowest to six months at a time, mm. one week to six months. And then they stopped and they might have had a multitude of cycles. I mean, the guys that are, you know, lifers in the military 20, 30 years, they've been on it multiple, multiple times. And, you know, there are some people who have been on it for, Three weeks, three three week cycles uh, during one year. That that was enough, based wow. upon looking at the blood. And in the blood, it shows the pattern. So there's no guessing, yes or no. You see, they were on ibuprofen. You look at the lab results: yeah. high luteinizing hormone, low free testosterone. Right. In someone who has had head trauma and have been on ibuprofen, their luteinizing hormone will be low. And their testosterone production will be low. Yeah. Even though they've been on ibuprofen because they have two insults, one central and the other peripheral, meaning the testicles. So in looking at uh, the veteran's um, medical history, it becomes very important to see that they had loss of consciousness, blast trauma, IED, repetitive gun, um, mortar fire, whatever, to create the scenario. And then we just push through it. Yeah. So just circling back to luteinizing hormone and pregnenolone, have, have you found increases in pregnenolone as well or just testosterone when taking Clomid? That's what I've always been curious about is if, yeah. is if it fuels that whole sex hormone chain. Correct. It's a cascade and luteinizing hormone, as I said earlier, is the rate limiting um, hormone for initiation of the entire cascade. The first thing in the cascade, pregnenolone. Yeah. Okay, so theoretically, all of them, and the fact that you bring that up is 
the fact that we're looking at doing a study for six months okay. where we only put them on Clomid, we measure all the hormones we normally do and only put them on Clomid to see how effective it is to what level it increases pregnenolone, DHEA, progesterone, testosterone, cortisol, all of them. Yeah, I'd be curious to see that for sure. Yeah, that is, you know, one of the things that uh, we'd like to do. There are a number of things that we'd like to do. It's all money-based and being yeah. self-funded, uh, self-funded helping our veterans. And we've had in the last six months a spike in it because our price base dropped again lower. December of last year, and I attribute it all to the to the support from uh, the immense community that uh, Joe Rogan has had to help us. He's really been effective. And, you know, each one of the podcasts that we've done with you, we see spikes in our people getting knowledgeable on it and then coming to us and they'll acquire some of our products and that goes into our veterans fund to help. So yeah. This is why in the past this year, I've been trying to get on as many uh, podcasts to share as much information to uh, have people come and take a look at us and see if it fits for them. Yeah. You know, um, I've uh, for the past 30 years have been addressing traumatic brain injury um, as, you know, the focus of what I'm doing. But the traumatic brain injury really is about brain health. And. So what we're doing, as you'll see on the website, we're going to start putting into the back burner use of things like traumatic brain injury, talking more about brain health, which is, you know, people say, well, I didn't have a traumatic brain injury. Well, do you know what a traumatic brain injury is? And they said, yeah, you're knocked unconscious. Well, no, there's something called subconcussive traumas, subtraumatic brain injury, where you know, you could be on a uh, skiing in the water from that bam, bam, bam of the waves. You could be down moguls on the ski and the same bam, bam, bam. You can using a jackhammer or the guys that are using 50 caliber guns or uh, some of the cops that I've seen in the past who are. People have had bad falls. They may not have hit their head, but just the fall you know, right. is rattling your entire body. Your brain's going to be impacted by that, too, even if your head doesn't hit the ground. Right. As well as, you know, I've been talking more about traumatic and non-traumatic, physical and non-physical head trauma. We right. say, how can you have a non-physical head trauma? Well, um, certain medications, alcohol, yeah. chemotherapy, yeah. x-rays, um, having a problem with the gut. My daughter, Allison, Dr. Allie, you know, takes care of all our civilians and she crosses over to take care of our uh, military's gut dysbiosis, malabsorption, allergies, and what have you. Why? Because inflammation, any place in the body, goes right into the brain, turns on the chemistry that creates the inflammation. So you can get that same inflammation by chronic stress. Chronic stress can cause it because it turns off a protective um, chemokine, chemical made by our immune system called fractalkin. And fractalkin keeps the inflammation under control. Under stress, cortisol goes up, shuts off the neurons production of fractalkin, and the cells, the immune cells in the brain called microglia, dump pro-inflammatory cytokines. Cytokines, we've heard about cytokines with COVID. Yeah. You know, cytokine storm. Mm -hmm. Well, think of it this way, cytokine storm in the lungs, cytokine storm in the heart, myocarditis, cytokine storm in the brain, long COVID. Okay, they're all tied together. Might be different mode of how it occurred, but what it generates is the same outcome, the same effect on the brain. Yeah. And that's what needs to be further uh, conveyed and understood is that it doesn't really matter what the insult is. The effect of that insult is the same. Right. So it all boils down it's all the same. And that's why last year I was a guest a lecturer for Department of Health and Human Services and then for the Texas Office of Acquired Brain Trauma. And the presentation I gave is about TBI and PTSD. And the issue is that, you know, the VA believes that PTSD and TBI are totally different things. My purview 
is that PTSD is a missed TBI. And to put it into common terms, you, TBI is a little fire. And if you get to the doctor, you get to your healthcare provider, and you tell them you had a head trauma, and they put you on things to help shut, turn that fire off, you're done. But unfortunately, they don't do that. Not unless you've had loss of consciousness and you're all effed up, do they do anything. Yeah. And then PTSD comes from those mild TBIs that the fire is left to burn out of control. And it crosses from one room of the brain to the next, from one lobe of the brain to the next. And in its process of involving other areas of the brain, starts accruing new symptoms. And when you look at the real science of, okay, compare the brains of PTSD and TBI, you'll see that the areas affected are the same. In the literature, they say the same. The differences might be under a TBI, you can have these little calcifications in different areas of the brain, implying that there was inflammation or there was bleeding um, because... Um, blood and components within a neuron or a blood vessel will cause inflammation, very bad inflammation, and the body tries to fix it. And it fixes it by laying down little calcium, okay? And that's the little spicules that you see on MRI scans and so forth. So it's really about clarifying the information and knowing that if you've had a traumatic brain injury, there's a possibility you can develop one of the psychiatric or psychological conditions that they say, oh, PTSD. No, yeah. it's neuroinflammation because this neuroinflammation shuts off, a, you know, serotonin, and melatonin. You get depressed, you can't sleep, you can't sleep, you get sleep deprivation syndrome, which has greater anxiety, depression, cognitive impairment. Yeah, definitely. You just, you just go back and, you know, we, we use our uh, brain rescue three in the morning and brain care two at night. They get better. We now have 109 participants in our tinnitus program ringing in the year. Oh, yeah. All vets, we have a 55% reversal in the tinnitus. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know about it. It's Until from brain care protocols? or It's from what? our protocol because another avenue of all the hormones we talked about um, pregnenolone, progesterone, allopregnanolone, testosterone, estradiol, um, they all have another effect on our in our system. And hormones are usually referred to as sex hormones, gender hormones, reproductive hormones, but they're much more than that. And we refer to them in medicine as pleiotropic, which means many functions. Right. So what happens is testosterone shuts off four nasty pro-inflammatory cytokines in the brain, interleukin cytokines, IL-1, IL-1B, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-6, and turns on the strongest anti-inflammatory chemical cytokine interleukin called IL-10. So if you don't have enough testosterone and you've had head trauma, what's going to happen is this inflammation is going to go under its own direction with that nothing to stop it. Yeah. And estradiol shuts off uh, something called MAPK, which is a kinase system that creates inflammation. Also, the inflammation generates uh, peroxynitrite, which damages neurotransmission, transmitter production, neuroreceptors, um, alters the enzymes that help us to make serotonin and melatonin. So it's a, it's a really beautifully complex system. And that's why I love this area of neuroendocrinology, which really should be restated as being neuroimmunoendocrinology because the immune system is involved big time with the glial cells or the microglia, the specific, autoimmune, uh, specific immune cells being turned on, turned off, producing pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, because they go through three changes, uh, M1, uh, M0, M1, and M2, and each stage sedentary to activated dumping stuff to M2, which is anti-inflammatory. And when you get into a chronic inflammatory state like CTE, repetitive gunfire, uh, boxers, you're stuck in the on position for pro-inflammation, and that's why you get problems. 
and um, I am working now with um, a major uh, lightweight boxer. I think it was lightweight. Um, his name is uh, Gerald um, McClellan. Gerald McClellan, boxer from the 80s, who was just incredible. And he got into a bad, uh, I think it was Ren uh, or Ben, that he was in a fight with and subsequently had a stroke. And for the last 30 years, his sister has been uh, taking beautifully care, care of him. And we met a couple of years ago. I was introduced to the Ring of Brotherhood, which is a, a national organization which helps to direct boxers when they leave the ring to medical care. And now what they're looking at is uh, addressing while they're still in the ring, what prophylactic things can they do? What prevention can they do? And that's one of our products. And um, I think the children and the granddaughter, no, it was the children of uh, Muhammad Ali are involved with it. So um, we started uh, Gerald on a protocol and I'll send you this beautiful article that was written by this journalist who only works in the in the boxing world, and he wrote about uh, this transition in two months. Two months, his transition. He's not there yet, but some major things. I'll send you a copy of it, and eventually we'll post it uh, on my website. It's called "A Day in the Life of Gerald McClellan." I didn't write it; have anything to do with it. It was news to me when I got sent a copy of it, but it. It talks about hope and the fact that even 30 years later, you've got this guy. He he had uh, partial bl uh, legal blindness, uh, problems hearing, and emotional volatility. Now he's calm and he's able to see better. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, it just blew me out of the water, this uh, journalist uh, that you'll read. I'll Gerald. send you a copy of it. Yeah, Gerald McClellan, 2024. Be beautiful article. Anyway... Uh, anything else that we need to touch yeah, on? Wrapping up on pregnenolone, do you think there's any benefit of taking pregnenolone and or DHEA pre-workout as a pre-workout protocol? Or is it is it better to take it at its, does it have that kind of immediate effect, I guess, is what I'm asking? It's, it's a great question. In fact, a study was done on uh, oral secretion of DHEA after 50 milligrams was taken. In about 90 minutes, you see a spike in testosterone and right. spike in estradiol, okay? You see testosterone does spike. So will that be a benefit? Yeah, that'll be a benefit. But it's also the fact that uh, DHEA goes down uh, conversion pathways to androstenedione, which gets converted to testosterone. Yeah. It gets down to the DHT, which helps with feeding the muscles while you're working. Right, right. So, so there are benefits. And, you know, if I didn't see this study, uh, I would have, uh, you know, still been searching for more data. And these are graphs that show yeah. every 20 minutes they did salivary uh, hormone level. I'm not a great believer in salivary because, um, you know, there's no marker in salivary testing that tells you if it's concentrated or diluted. Right, right. You know, but in things like urine, um, what we have in urine is creatine and BUN to tell us whether or not you're concentrated or diluted. Yeah. You know, so that's why we did for a year whew, in the late 90s studies on uh, salivary com uh, compared to serum. And I'm stuck on serum levels, you know, all our technology is based upon serum levels and uh, graphs and charts and, uh, you know, support for all our doctors that we're working with to help them to get the cutting edge. But yeah, uh, inconsistencies between between salivary and blood markers. Sometimes you see someone with high levels of hormones via saliva test, and then it's pretty low on blood oh, tests. And the person feels terrible. So it's perplexing to that person. They go, look, I have no sex drive. I feel terrible. I did a saliva test and my levels are high. And blood markers, they're low. Yeah. Um, and that could be a genetic uniqueness of the individual. Yeah. It's like we have um, something called the E1, E2 flip. Uh, E1 is estrone. E2 is estradiol. Yep. So... What happens is DHEA 
can convert down one of two pathways. It can go down what we call the left pathway, which is androstene dione to estrone, or else it can go to the right pathway, not correct or wrong, but the right pathway, which is DHEA to testosterone to estradiol. And that is the usual primary pathway. But we come across people who have the other way, where they go down the other pathway, which is due to, I think it's a uh, 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase or hydroxylase, whatever it is, this long-named enzyme. Right. I try to remember it, but... Oh, you, you, recalled it. you recalled it pretty well. That's a hard one to remember. <laughs> yeah, well, I've memorized the chart so many times. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, because I lecture on it so much because <laughs> doctors need to know that chart because it gives them a better understanding other than, oh, you just need testosterone and forget it. The consequences of giving just testosterone is you lose luteinizing hormone, therefore you lose 35 plus hormones in the brain. So we always give DHEA and pregnenolone because pregnenolone is the head of one pathway and is the head of the DHEA. So instead of stressing pregnenolone, to go back down both pathways, we use DHEA and pregnenolone, and we get great responses. I mean, DHEA um, is uh, protects your lungs from cytokine storm. Mm -hmm. DHEA in the um, Massachusetts, male Massachusetts aging study showed that DHEA can protect you from ischemic heart disease, which is heart attack and death. So if you're at the lowest amount. Uh, first quartile, the first 25% of the range, you have the highest amount of death and hospitalization after a heart attack, so you survive. But at the highest quartile, the fourth quartile, 75 to 100% of the range of the laboratory result, no death, and you got a significant reduction in surviving heart attack, a heart attack that you survive from. And DHEA in the brain stimulates growth hormone production. That's why you take DHEA after dinner. Increases to uh, growth hormone production in males 10%, females 15 to 20%. It drops into leukin 6. People say, what's that? I said, you get a cold. You feel smarter or less smart? Everybody says less smart. I said, that's the interleukin 6. DHEA drops that. Also, uh, the um, DHEA helps reduce depression. A uh, whole bunch of articles coming out since 1952, 1993. Dr. Morales did a major study showing the effect of this natural product on dropping your level of uh, depression. Yeah. Brilliant. And then in multiple sclerosis, way back when, we, in the 40s, I think it was, we had DHEA to help stimulate the coating of nerves to come back, myelin. Turns out that in some people, they're not making DHEA, so the cell responsible for generating myelin, called oligodendrocyte, um, doesn't make myelin that wraps around and is an insulator of nerves. So you don't make it, so the nerve short circuit, okay? Um, they're now looking at uh, multiple sclerosis as being an autoimmune disease derived from inflammation in the brain. When you have inflammation in the brain, the blood in the circulation is barriered from getting into the brain through something called the blood-brain barrier. So it's highly selective, highly selective. But what have we found about traumas and inflammation in the brain? Inflammation from the gut can cause a breakdown in that barrier, so what happens is the stuff that shouldn't be in the brain from the periphery, from our circulation below the neck, gets yeah. into the brain and turns on the immune system. And what does it do? It makes antibodies against the cells, against the hypothalamus, against the pituitary gland, against hormones, and that could be the problem. So in certain illnesses like um, Sheehan's, uh, hypothyroidism. Sheehan's is occurs in uh, women who are given birth from pushing. It causes rupture of the stalk between the pituitary and the pitu pituitary and the hypothalamus, and you lose the uh, production of hormones in the pituitary. Growth hormones first to go, then testosterone, estrogen, then thyroid, then cortisol.
So you see this pattern. And what have they found in 100% of them? Antibodies against the hypothalamus and the pituitary because leakage of the, of the uh, blood-brain barrier, negative into it. So anyway, but uh, DHEA and pregnenolone, uh, we use it on all our patients who are on Clomid as well as on injectable testosterone. Yeah. To prevent loss. That's a, that's a very effective stack. The pregnenolone, DHEA, Clomid, you're just covered. Yep. It's yep. so multifaceted. Yeah, it works well. And it's, you know, our patients pay like uh, 92 bucks for a six month supply. Right. It's inexpensive as well. It's the other big. Yeah. Inexpe oh, yeah. Well, it's because uh, the company that provides the services to us is owned by the uh, military guys. Okay. And, and they came to us a couple of years ago. Basically, they said, We see what you're doing. We want to participate and help. Right now, I think uh, Clomid is. Um, uh, is yeah, I think Clomid's like 134 bucks normally. Okay, I've seen it as low as sixty dollars and some for one month supply, or 134 yeah. for 134 per month, sixty to 134. Okay, depend on where you go. For how many tablets? How many 50 milligram tablets? Thirty. Okay. Okay. Thirty. Yeah, and um, what happened was for some reason that we won't go into. <laughs> the only company that makes um, the that was making the generic clomiphene gone mm. overnight gone. I was paying twenty bucks a box of thirty, and then they went up to sixty dollars, ninety dollars. Okay, because unavailable. This one company that had the cornered the market in clomiphene citrate, gone. Hmm. Don't understand why, you know? But anyway, politics of pharmacy. Yeah, no So doubt. someone else benefited, maybe the other companies, the e clomid maybe, I don't know. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, what is it, conspiracy. And I don't yeah. like going into conspiracies. Oh, I know. Well, we can wrap up with this. Just uh, when I when I see all the marketing for enclomaphene, I think they often overstate the possible. They state it as emphatic negatives, where it should be at the very most possible negatives. Correct. Or very unlikely negatives, right? Yeah. But for marketing purposes, I'm trying to sell something. So I'm trying to sell you on enclomaphene. So I have to delineate what I feel are the differences between this and clomiphene citrate, which is considerably cheaper and way more accessible. Right. You just overstate the possible proponents or the benefits, and then you exaggerate the negatives. So that's why I'm saying people have to be very cautious with this because yeah. often I have people come to me who say, I want to, I don't want to take clomid because of all these side effects, even though they've never taken it before. I'm trying right. to like get in clomiphene. Right. So, well, look, it's 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 a two-pronged response in the sense that one, they're trying to state that all the negatives, if there are any negatives, are from zuclomaphene. So just eliminating that eliminates the negatives. Whether that's true or not, who knows? But it doesn't seem that there are any negatives when it's dosed appropriately. Correct. And, you know, I still have a rare person who perceives, perceives that their symptoms, new symptoms are due to clomid since that's the only thing that they've added that's a medication. But right. what about their nutrition what about their hydration what about their smoking weed drinking alcohol don't you think those things have influence yeah 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 exactly you know okay. so i don't argue with anyone about it uh i don't try to push my point other than to say that yeah you could be unique and have that yeah okay well you just have to make sure that you're looking at information versus marketing copy and a lot of times you're reading marketing copies not right. information it's information to help sell a product, which may be useful about educating you about the product, but the point is, is to sell you on something. But they're going to exaggerate certain components to make it more appealing to you. Absolutely. You know, at least in the pharmaceutical and the PDR, the physician desk reference, when they talk about symptoms, adverse symptoms, they have it less than 1%, less than 5%, less than 10%, less than 20%. But if I was to remove the less thens and just put the listing of what side effects 
can occur, you've got a list that is huge. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. The ones I look, people, yeah, the yeah. ones I look at are, you know, 10% or more. Right. You know, if you have the possibility of 10% or less, that means that one in a hundred people might get, right. you know, or, or 10 out of a hundred might get a symptom or one out of 10. So how do you know if you're going to have an adverse effect if you don't try right. to get it, you know? But the people, that's why I tell people, don't go to the internet and read about Clomid because it pre gives them preconceived notion. Yeah. And what, you know, I did 500 hours of psych and psychology and in my training and preconceived notion is what they think is, is. And I'll end with a story that comes off of, um, what's that, uh, TED Talk. Yeah. Where this doctor gets on the stage and starts talking about this issue of uh, nociceptive and um, what is it? Uh, preconceived notion. And right. she talks about a study that was done where there were stage four cancer patients that were told about an injectable medication that they had to get once a week and only this clinic had it. And they went into the clinic and they got the injections. They came with their MRI CTs of their cancers and so forth, stage four. And they took the injections and the clinic monitored them to see what happened to their cancers. And they saw the cancer started shrinking and the people were feeling great. And then at a period of time, I don't remember if it was three months, six months or a year down the road, they hypothetically ran out of the medication. So people came and were supposed to get it. They didn't get it. And they monitored their tumor. So what happened was the tumor shrunk when they were actively on it. The tumor grew when they were off of it. Right, right. And then she says what they were injecting them with was water. Yeah. You yeah. see that? This oh, lady's, yeah. uh, this doc's been on there a couple of times. Beautiful, no susceptive, though the fact, the negative perception that we have, okay? Placebo effect, nocebo effect, you know, the positive yeah. and the negative effects, all the words that they use in doing research. But it was, you know, was it morally right or ethically right uh, to do it? That's a side point. The point was that they believed and therefore... And what does it tell you about our body? If you believe, you know, you can do whatever you want or you can make changes, you know. You yeah. may, and that keeps on blowing me out of the water. I'm a scientist and I look at that done by scientists in a methodology that's scientific. And how do you say nay? How do you say no, that's not true? Yeah. Yeah. You know. Anyway, it's like about aliens and shit like that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's end with where can people find out more information about your products and about your services? Okay, um, if they want to get purely educational material, it's at www.tbihelpnow.org, and the key areas are the science which has articles that I've written on psilocybin, on neuroinflammation and depression, anxiety, bipolar, uh, about endocrine disrupting chemicals. How is it that we're seeing so many gender dysphoric people these days because of all the chemistry that our parents and grandparents have incorporated into their body that gets passed, it's uh, generationally, transgenerationally, down to children who are now we're witnessing have had their hormones that regulate gender during uh, being in the womb disrupted. And then there's a section which is media, some of the uh, short videos I make. There's one that's called uh, Testosterone, the Double-Edged Sword, which talks about things that we need to do, look for ibuprofen related, look for trauma related, um, to determine whether or not the reason for the disruption in the production of testosterone is coming from things that are easy to fix without the needle. Right. Without right. a needle. That's the key. And, you know, the government is working on diminishing our availability of testosterone. The state of California refuses to allow our blended testosterone in from Texas into California. Mm. 
Yeah. So I've moved everything to Texas. You know, I have a house there and everything. Right now, I'm transiently in California, getting ready to leave the country to start educating in the Southeast, Southeast Asia. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So and then uh, if you want to look at products, uh, the products are at MillenniumHealthStore.com. And there are products there. And I will get a uh, code uh, to Mike that he can make available to you so you can get a discount as long as you also sign in as a subscriber to the website where we send you emails. We only send you information, education and um discount codes right. we don't send bullshit and send <laughs> a lot of crap out there it's just to send you some education when something new occurs we'll send you an email if there's a code like we have periodically 30 percent off we're going to give you a code for getting the uh, video for 50 percent off you know if you want to get a video it'll be good for the first hundred people that sign in for it okay and that's about it um, you can just Google my name, uh, Mark L. Gordon, on uh, Google, and you'll see some of the uh, projects that we've done, uh, some of the people we work with. Uh, but I like working with Michael anyway. Uh, hey, you do a great job. I like working with you, and I've you've used many of your protocols before, and they're very effective, and I've used many of your products before, and they're excellent. So yeah. I recommend you wholeheartedly. I have for many years, and I recommend everyone check out your stuff. Yeah. And thank you for everything you're doing for our armed services members. I think that's incredible because a lot of times people say I support the troops, but often that's just banter. You know, and it's nice. It's hey, it's nice to go say you support the troops to someone. I'm not diminishing that, right. but it's it's even better when you actually do something tangible that actually does improve the lives of people that have put their lives on the line for all of us. So I think that's absolutely. Fantastic. And you know, one of the things that freaks them out is that I'm a civilian. <laughs> and they say, why are you a civilian doing this? We've, as I said, more than 1,600 guys that we've financially and medically helped uh, get through our program. And it's, uh, it took me a while to figure it out. It's my father was Army. And the reason why I'm in medicine is because my father died at an early age from bone cancer that they're finding on Cap Lejeune multiple myeloma. Mm. So, you know, that was what stimulated caused me to go into medicine. I was in research and computer technology. I should have stayed in that. I'd probably be a billionaire by now. <laughs> <you know? laughs> anyway. All right, Mike, uh, I will send you in a request. I need more of your wonderful Boost product. Okay. okay. Cool. Patients are loving it. Oh, okay. good. I hear that. Your yes, testosterone booster awesome. works awesome. very well. Thank you. Awesome. Appreciate yeah. you. Thank you. We go ahead and stop recording.